everyone. Um, my name's Andrea Grimes. I am program coordinator, program manager, sorry. It's all brand new to me. Um, program manager um, up in the Book Arts and Special Collections Center. And we every year around this time, for the past couple of years, we've welcomed the San Francisco Zine Fest and the program, both the picnic and the program, thinking captions, reading, um, as a run up to the very wonderful zine fest that happens every Labor Day. I'm really excited to be going to the zine fest this year because it's every year it seems to get better. Um, so uh, I want to let you know that I work in book arts and special collections. Uh, which is also, I've got some brochures over there, and we are the home of the Little Magazine Collection, which houses over 4,000 items, um, about 1,000 or more titles of Little Magazines and Zines. Uh, zines first started coming into our collection in about 1990. So we've got zines from going, uh, well, back in the 80s forward. Um, so when you have time, come up and check us out. So I just, before we get uh, things started, I just wanted to give you a few housekeeping tips, and that is please turn your cell phones to silent. Um, if you need to use the restrooms, just go out the door, turn left, and go underneath the stairs. You'll see the restrooms there. Um, in case of an emergency, we won't take the elevator, but we'll walk up the stairs or through the secret back way uh, that will take us out onto the street for to your safety. Um, uh, I think what I'd like to do is now introduce the Zine Fest organizer, A.V. Jetter, who will get the show rolling. A.V. Hello, welcome to Zine Fest Thanking Captions. Um, excited to be here. We have four great readers tonight for you. Um, my name is A.V. Jetter. I'm one of the organizers, and um, I really am super excited to hear from all these readers. I'm going to tell you a little bit about each one as they come up. Um, give Pollyanna just a couple more minutes, um, and then tell you a little bit more. Uh, but we can start out by talking about Zine Fest, which all of you know is happening on Sunday the 2nd in Golden Gate Park, uh, County Fair Building. Um, tell everybody, put it on your social media. Um, just a little bit about Zine Fest. Um, it's founded in 2001, um, and San Francisco Zine Fest seeks to advance the do-it-yourself ethos by fostering community through the Bay Area. And in our annual festival and its accompanying panels and workshops, we celebrate and support independent writers, artists, and creators allowing them to share their work on an ever-growing audience in exhibitions and public events, like this one, yay! <laughs> so, without further ado, um, I just want to introduce Pollyanna, I'm going to destroy your last name, I'm sorry, Is Izazari? Irizari. Irizari. Um, she is a wonderful organizer in her own right. Um, she works with uh, San Jose, uh, ZineCon. She's one of the founding members and works with a lot of community organizations in San Jose, puts together zines. Her background, she's a librarian, and I believe you come from f the East Coast, Philadelphia, I, recently. I have a story. I live in Philadelphia. So, now she's in San Jose, uh, bringing her great uh, DIY spirit. Uh, and she's just an awesome person, one of the most genuine and kind uh, people in the zine community. Uh, but without further ado, um, let's hear from Pollyanna. Thank you. Thank you all so much. I, uh, I do live in San Jose. That's actually just where I came from uh, just now. It took me a little bit to get up here. Um, so I just really appreciate everyone's um, patience. Um, it's, I think it's cool that the train is called a baby bullet. <laughs> what is that? What's that all about? Oh, that's me. Uh, bibliophiliac zines is what I call my zines. Um, 
Uh, I am a librarian. Um, I'm currently not employed as a librarian, um, but uh, to keep professional, I just keep my writing under the, the you know, the pseudonym. South Bay DOI Zine Collective is the, um, what we call the, the zine library um, in San Jose. It's housed at the LGBTQ youth space. Okay, I'm gonna start with training wheels. This scene is about my cross country train trip from Philadelphia to Seattle. In the spring of 2009, I crossed this large country by Amtrak train twice. My westbound trip originated in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania and ended in King Street Station in Seattle, Washington. One week later, I departed Portland, Oregon's Union Station on my return journey to the East Coast. I traveled the entire route of the Empire Builder twice, and the Capitol Limited and the Cardinal routes too. It was quiet, peaceful, crowded, and jarring, and I was utterly exhausted when I finally returned home. Let me tell you about my personal manifest destiny. I have traveled extensively via Philly's 30th Street Station ever since I moved to the city of... <laughs> I've never done this with a slideshow before. <laughs> it's really weird. <laughs> the city of Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. This train station hub serves as a conduit from several Amtrak routes to SEPTA, uh, Southeast Pennsylvania Transit Authority's regional rail, and the local subway, trolley, and bus services. Part of the old Pennsylvania Railroad, the building defines splendor in a grand scale, Philly style. An exercise in high contrast with vaulted neoclassical ceilings, uh, capping rows of marble and wood benches where the city's large homeless population frequently sleeps. College kids and executives mingle with groups of Amish travelers, everyone waiting for something. I eagerly departed, happy to exchange those gray skies for the new, unexplored, yet also rainy destination of the Pacific Northwest. The first step of my trip took me to Washington, D.C., where I would join the Capitol Limited. I had made that particular journey before when visiting friends and food in Chicago. Nothing new to see here, but I was excited to spend a five-hour layover exploring the Loop, especially the Bean and Millennium Park. I, I love being a tourist, it's so shiny. Um, that first night on the train, I slept fitfully, contorting in my coach seat, dreaming about the deep dish pizza and broad shoulders. Departing Chicago, I thought I had this trip licked. <laughs> Wasn't I halfway through? I was in the Midwest after all. This must be the midway point, surely. Intellectually, I knew I had three more days and two more nights of travel. Um, but I was ready to be in Seattle, impatient to don some flannel and ghost hunt Kurt Cobain. <laughs> the Empire Builder is a double-decker train, somehow appearing even more imposing from afar as it is when boarding. I climbed up, up, up small steps like a child, left foot, right foot onto a stool. Then I launched myself into the train, pulling myself up hand over hand using a thin, slick metal railing bolted to the train's side by the door. Here, there are bathrooms, coffin small commodes with overflowing sinks. There, beyond some luggage for um, some shelves for large luggage, are the reserved seats set aside for the wheelchair bound and their companions. And then another climb, this time up two sets of narrow stairs to the coach seating area. I was fortunate enough to be traveling on a half full, half empty train, which means I had an entire row of seats to myself. If I position myself just right, one hip there, the other here, legs propped up just so, it was almost as comfortable as sleeping in a cot. Despite all this careful comfort choreography, my seat attracted the least of my attention. I sat transfixed by the view. Hold on, this is good. Okay. <laughs> there was so much to see. From sunup to sundown, my small nose was pressed up against the large plate glass window, taking it all in. Mm. The so-called flyover states are the epitome of scenic vistas, and I could not get enough of that big sky country. I was surprised at the amount and variety of wildlife I observed, too. I assumed a large locomotive such as ours would have scared it all away. Birds of all shapes and sizes and plumage, rabbits, or were they hares? Deer and antelope all watched us watching them. At one point, 
The train was pursued for at least two miles by a small yet tenacious pack of playfully romping coyotes. It was the cutest dog spotting ever. From last October's trek to Chicago, I need to bring non-perishable food for meals and snacks and a reusable water bottle. I've got mine over there. I had packed a satchel with plenty of reading material and even a knitting project. However, what I really wanted to do was play with my recently purchased smartphone. So where were the power outlets? This is funny because I, I wrote this in like 2009. That's not even a decade ago and that was like right when smartphones were a thing for like, I mean iPhones were already a thing, but you know, for poor people. Um, so where were the power outlets? I remember seeing one in the Sightseer Lounge. Wait, please don't tell me. Yes, yeah, it's true. All of the coach passengers are to share that single outlet, taking turns fueling their laptops, DVD players, phones, and listening device of choice. I charge my cellular phone and my MP3 player in the dead of night while listening to my new friends read poetry, play the harmonica, and snore through their night's sleep. My new friends were farmers, librarians, Blackfoot, and cowboys. I was asked if I knew Jesus at the beginning of one day and offered drugs at the end of it. We shared the same space for thousands of miles, but many never shared their names. We passed through many cities, such as Minneapolis and Fargo and San Francisco. Woo! <laughs> I'd read in this in Minneapolis, and everyone cheered for Minneapolis, so I didn't actually pass San Francisco, but I did today and hundreds of miles of open land. Massive silos and one-room cabins sat adjacent to the railroad tracks. We slid slowly by the main street of a small town in a large state, several times, rolling by at a speed to recognize cars, but not faces. It was beautiful, it was epic, and there were many, many smoke breaks um, and dance breaks. I actually wasn't smoking at the time. When the last day of our travels broke, we found ourselves in Washington State. So it was Washington, D.C. to Washington State. Was it last week or last year that I was in the other Washington? Now I was not only the traveler, now I, was, now I was not the only traveler leaning up into the window, ogling the jagged peaks and snow-dusted evergreen trees. Suddenly, we sunk to sea level, following Puget Sound into Seattle. Traveling by train eases the shock of witnessing such a dramatic shift in environment. Um, we have time to adjust to the change in scenery and climate. Uh, it's a lot different than like flying, right, and landing. We eased into a different region's culture instead of landing in its midst. King Street Station, like every other Amtrak station I encountered, is close to the town center. So when we arrived in Seattle, we were there. So I'm glad I got to show you all this because um, I usually just print it in black ink. It's a, I sell my zines for like one to five bucks sliding scale. So um, this is a really great opportunity to show these color photos. Okay. I'm going to read my next zine. This is actually my most recent zine. Um, and the first time I used, uh, I made a color zine because I made collages at one of at our first zine making workshop with the South Bay DIY Zine Collective. Uh, we hold workshops at the LGBTQ space in downtown San Jose. So if you're ever in San Jose, come through. The library is accessible to the public, open Monday through Friday. 3 to 9 p.m. Identity Crisis by me. Okay, this has a lot of cuss words, so. Filling out the motherfucking U.S. Census form should not be the catalyst for my rapid decline into a terrifying identity crisis. I've tried over question nine several times now, and I don't know how to fix this. I cannot fix this. There are no atheists in foxholes. Jesus Christ, save me from this. I wish I had a shrink. The last one wouldn't do. I wish I had someone to talk to. My brother doesn't, ev doesn't want to ever talk about this. Our parents, Jose, Jose, can you see? Iaida, like the opera, named us Pollyanna. Pollyanna, 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 and Ian Paul, because we are white. Don't you know you're white? Don't listen when Tommy Hicks calls you an Oreo, a spick, a wetback. We are white. White, white like the picket fence. We couldn't wait to get off that fucking island. Macho imami. 
Iacono, Ila Negrita, Abuelita, si senor, lo siento. I was 37 years old when I finally figured out Moorish is code for black. I grew up in the Silicon Valley of Texas Instruments and Sun Systems, Dell and Honeywell. I grew up sick, feeling FOMO long before the advent of MOC Makeout Club, um, Friendster, MySpace, et cetera, Web 2.0 websites, before digital cameras, before streaming video live feeds. I turned to IRC, AOL, and Yahoo Chat for companionship when I was sick. My local friends were out partying or adrift on Relationship Island. My family was extremely dysfunctional, and I was home alone, sick in bed and hurting, chatting, spilling my guts to strangers in a chat room. The disconnect between my long-standing virtual relationships and my broken physical body is like oil and water. Olive oil, olive complexion, sallow, yellow, scared, pale, white, white, white. We can't wear white. We have yellow tones. Yellow tones, brown skin, black hair, hairy arms, hairy legs, hairy back like a gorilla. Thanks, bully kid at the neighborhood swimming pool. Thanks for calling me a gorilla when I was in fourth grade. I shaved all of my arm and leg hair off after that and got in a really big trouble with my mother. After that, I started wearing a t-shirt and shorts over my bathing suit. Finally, I just stopped swimming altogether. That'll learn them. I moved to San Jose, California three years ago after spending over a decade in Philly. But I call Dallas, Texas home, and I am Boricua, born in Ponce on the island now known as Puerto Rico. I was assigned female at birth, but I am barren due to PCOS, polycystic ovary syndrome. That chronic genetic condition is often comorbid with other endocrine disorders. Lucky me. Long story short, I'm a brown, disabled, intersex, middle-aged librarian, and I've been identifying as asexual for roughly seven years now, right around the time I was diagnosed with interstitial cystitis. You can Google that one. It's really boring, but painful. I am still processing where, or even if, I am on the queer spectrum. I often feel like the odd man out. I come from a very small family. My abuela suffered many miscarriages at the hands of American doctors, and her surviving offspring also struggle with reproductive issues. Many Puerto Ricans do. When we left the island, I was two years old, and my conservative parents, desperately trying to assimilate us into mainstream American culture, promised to teach me only English so I wouldn't speak with an accent, so my white teachers wouldn't be prejudiced against me. That is literally what I was told when I would ask why I didn't know Spanish and that my mother had read about Puerto Ricans in the Bronx being discriminated against due to, her, due to their accents. Um, turns out that prize-winning series of newspaper articles, I think it was in the Wall Street Journal in the 70s, was actually fake news. But while truly I digress, suffice it to say, I'm like the man without a country, old plain buttons himself. I've spent too many years trying to fit someone else's mold of who I should be. Not woman enough not young enough, not brown enough, not sick enough, not queer enough, too young for my profession as a librarian, too old for my hobbies, I'm a zinester and a punk rocker. My own fucking family rejects me, and frankly, I'm sick of it, I reject it all. I'd rather do revolutionary shit with my friends. Hi, friends. <laughs> Yet I feel like a fraud among my colleagues due to my failure to secure a professional librarian position. I feel like a fraud in the scene because I got kicked out of a punk band for not being a good enough drummer. I feel like a fraud among scooterists because of my inability to learn how to wrench and now postpone break ride. I feel like a fraud among women because PCOS robbed me of the ability to bear children. I feel like a fraud among femmes because of my inability to make myself look beautiful. I often feel like a fraud among my friends and my chronic illness forces me to stay home instead of hang out. I feel like a fraud among humanity because of my lack of long-term relationship. But every day I make a choice. Every day of my life I think about suicide. What do I have to live for? No man will have me, my parents refuse to see me, I'm constantly in excruciating physical pain and my own profession doesn't want me. 
At best, society laughs at me. At worst, I am verbally, physically, and one time, sexually assaulted. I was born on an island I cannot afford to live, whose language I wasn't taught to speak, and this home I have chosen is caught thick in the jaws of gentrification, San Jose. What do I have to live for? Despite all of this, every day I make a choice to live with the complex post-traumatic stress disorder I experience as someone who lives with chronic pain, as a survivor of assault, as someone who lives with constant microaggressions, like people touching my hair, et cetera, and as a survivor of the terrorist attacks on NYC in September 11, 2001. I mean, how can anyone, how can you even talk about that? Fuck your country, really, your wars, your police, your violent sports, your sexual predators, your census, and your money. I live in spite of you. I don't even really know where to begin, much less end this. I'm so upset, but this is just another thing, you know? What else is going to upset me? Who knows? Well, I think I messed up the scanning, sorry. So that was identity crisis. That's my most recent zine. Um, it's also my heaviest. Um, but my angriest one is yet to be published. <laughs> and I'm gonna conclude with that one. How to use your public library to support your zine scene. MRR article idea. I'm thinking of submitting this one to Maximum Rock and Roll. Public libraries are racist, neo-colonizing, nonprofit industrial complex gentrification agents. The wealthy white people who run libraries are not only a part of the neoliberal elite, they actively help incubate and educate this American ruling class. According to their mission statements, public libraries should represent the diversity of the communities we serve, yet 85% of librarians identify as white. Here are some ways the zine community can hold our libraries accountable. Ask your local library to table at your zine events and charge them for the privilege. Libraries are desperate to stay relevant and programming librarians crave access to outreach to teens, tweens, millennials, and Gen Xers. Hold your zine fest for free at the main branch. Waive zine fest tabling fees for zines by POC, zinesters who work in languages other than English, zinesters under the age of 17, LGBTQ identified zinesters, hell, make your entire zine fest sliding scale donation based and not a flop to table with the support of your public library. Petition your local public library for financial support. Supporting zines supports multiple literacies as well as public education. Use your partnership with the library to create partnerships with local schools. After all, making zines counts for both liberal arts and STEM. Um, STEM, science, technology, engineering, and uh, mathematics um, in the California Common Core. Working with schools can lead to access to resources such as funds coded for public education, all ages safe spaces to hold zine events, and professional support for developing zine-based curriculum. And maybe even just art supplies and a copy machine hookup can mean even more zines being made. Um, finally, hold one-off zine-making workshops in your local library's meeting rooms. In fact, create a makerspace in the library to support local DIY publishing, giving zinesters access to scanners, layout, and design programs, and free or sliding scale uh, zero to 10 cent copies supports the uplift of marginalized voices. And isn't that what zines are all about? Thank you. Thank you. This is... Um, the event the week after San Francisco Zine Fest uh, is Bay Area Queer Zine Fest, and this is the flyer. Um, the artist of the flyer is here in the room. Thank you, Lawrence. Um, you can follow me at San Jose Zine Con or South Bay DIY Zine Collective on Instagram. It's on the internet. Um, and here I am. Thank you so much for listening and for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pollyanna. Next up, we have Brina Nunez. Uh, Brina Nunez's cartoons and zines are a ode to black Central Americans who may have issues reclaiming their, their Latinhood, their blackness, and Central American <laughs> identity. She also is a musician and writes about um, 
her experience as a um, uh, Central American, um, she has a, a zine called, I'm going to mess this up, sorry, <laughs> Kolocha Head. <laughs> okay, uh, it's, it stands for Curly Head, and um, it talks about her, her place in the mixed culture, right? <laughs> Stop making me laugh. And <laughs> her, her, her zines are wonderful. They talk about identity, and they're not just political. They're very well-rendered artwork, too. I'm a super huge fan of Brina. She's an amazing person, amazing work. Um, but her zines do more than tell stories. They actually sort of bring to life um, ideas that we don't often talk about. We don't often talk about colorism and identity politics within uh, racial groups. So. Um, I won't stand up here and talk forever. Um, please welcome Brina Nunez. Do I just click on the down button? Oh, this. Oh, that's so cool. A remote. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Brina Nunez. Hi, I'm Brina. <laughs> Hello. Um, yeah, I am Central American descent, Afro Latinx, um, and I'm a comic book artist. I'm currently based in Oakland by way of San Bruno, California. My family migrated here to the Mission District. Um, I want to say like during late seventies between like the mid 70s and um, late 70s, something like that. And yeah, I'll just like go ahead and just show you what I do. So, <laughs> um, why you are Cachimbonics? Um, I'm Salvadoran, I'm half Salvadoran, I'm half Guatemalan. And part of me reclaiming my Central American identity is learning um, caliche, um, sayings, um, words that are, um, that originated from El Salvador. And cachimbon is the more masculine term for um, what it means to be amazing, great. And I learned this as I was like going um, through my undergrad years at San Francisco State University and being with other like dope salvies, like my half salvi sister in the audience. <laughs> Santa Necas, yeah, in the house. <laughs> and I just wanted to create like a feel good zine about why our people are amazing and why I love this word so much. So these are the reasons why our people are Cachimbonics, which I turned out to be like a more gender neutral term for our non-binary brothers and sisters and trans brother, brothers and sisters. Number one, you still love to read comic books even when people thought they weren't quote unquote cool. Number two, you still rewatch your favorite anime movies because they're radical as fuck. And that's a little cosplay of, um, um, Oh my God, what was her name? Manonoke Hime. Thank you, Pollyanna. <laughs> Reason number three why you're cachimbonics. You come from a land and a people who created one of the best dishes in the world. Pupusas. Make pupusas, not war. <laughs> number four, you're friends with the cutest local celebrity and you can watch this Pomeranian at this actual like Instagram profile at Madam Piper. And she's just taking a selfie. This is the perfect selfie lighting. <laughs> Shout out to my homegirl Liz Mayorga for introducing me to her amazing companion. Why, you're, why you are Cachimbonics, reason number five. You dance to cumbia, salsa, goth, punk, emo, jazz, da da da. Yeah, you basically get down. La negra tiene tombao, azúcar, azúcar. Reason number six, you are a one of a kind. Embrace your weirdoness because it's hella cute. Reason number seven, 
Um, this is all for all the really sensitive Central Americans and Afro-Latinx people in the diaspora. You're trying to be okay with crying because we've been taught to repress anger and sadness. Your tears are beautiful. Reason number eight, your melanin pops, your hair defies gravity, you're educated, and your existence, your existence is resistance. And on that note, uh, Bosos Cachimonics, you are amazing, you are fantastic, you are everything. So that was like my latest zine, and I'm just gonna read a few things from um, a zine that I created a couple of years ago, um, I wanna say back in 2014, called Center of My Heart, and it's like a love letter to uh, Central American queers, femmes, uh, Afro-Latinx people from the diaspora. Um, because I love y'all, and y'all deserve so, all of the praise and the glory for all of the wonderful content that y'all are making out there. Let's see. And some of the illustrations in the zine are inspired by actual um, Central Americans I've met in the zine scene and elsewhere on the internet because the internet has a lot of cool stuff and accessibility to all these amazing people. So I'll just do like English and Spanish. I'll, I'll do the English part, or actually I'll do Spanish first. Tu estética darks me pone a gusto porque veo la solidaridad en tus ojos. Familiar es tu acento, extrañeza y humildad que coincide con mi propia. Your darks aesthetics puts me at ease because I see solidarity in your eyes. Familiar is your accent, strangeness, and humbleness that matches that of my own. That's a love letter to that Nicoya punk that I met a couple of years ago. Hondureña queen. Fashionista, academia, educadora, modela. Una celebridad en su propio derecho. Mujer, tu sensibilidad no apologita, apologética, perdón, my Spanish isn't so great. Son infecciones influyentes. Fashionista, academic, educator, model, a celebrity in her own right. Mujer, your unapologetic sensibilities are infectious and influential to all of us. and to the Belizean butterfly. Esta diaspora, tal vez pequeña en comparación con la inmensidad de las otras Américas, sin embargo, nuestras narraciones tienen muchos ritmos, geometría compleja que de Geometría compleja que da una gran historia a nuestra arquitectura. This diaspora, it may be small in comparison to the vastness of the other Americas, yet our narratives hold so many rhythms, complex geometry that gives a great story to our architecture. Yeah, that's a little preview to that zine. And uh, I'm also going to comic book school. I'm getting an MFA in comics at California College of the Arts. Yeah, I'm really so excited about that. And saying that out loud is like so reaffirming. <laughs> um, the next comic is called Dear Sentida. And it's based off of like my personal like things with like dating and being socially awkward person of color. Um, and I made this after my first semester um, um, going to CCA as a first year. Boop. And the main character in this comic is pretty much myself as like a chibi eyes crocodile person. So my life has changed in a pretty biggish way. 
I began to feel less cynical about stumbling into a romantic relationship, I guess. I don't know, meh. I have absolutely enjoyed a fulfilling life of singledom. I don't know how I got so comfortable in my solitude, but it may be because I enjoy being alone. But now I got this newfound confidence where I'm ready to find that lucky someone who gets to share boring adult-like activities like uh, eating pizza, chow mein, pupusas, napping, watching cartoons, and yeah, I don't know. I just don't want to be seen. I don't want to be seen as being too weird. Zines, mo zines. Hello. <laughs> Can I ask you something? <laughs> no, it didn't hurt when I fell from heaven. That's the third time I heard that line today. A simple hello, how are you would be nice for a chick. Oh, hot damn. Uh, well, I didn't really say much, but I promise I won't start this off with a pickup line. I just noticed that you come to the same spot as me, but you come through by yourself. And anyway, I want to ask if, if you'd like to go on a non-platonic coffee date sometime? Uh, okay, um, I'm actually not prepared for this. Oh, damn, like, he, he sounds kind of nice and actually genuine, and I don't know, maybe maybe he's really a, a sweet guy, but maybe, I don't know, I, I can't, don't trust people. Um, maybe I should give him a chance, or maybe give him my email address instead of my phone number. But that really already means it's like, I'm not interested in him, but that could be okay. Maybe he's like, oh, damn, I've been standing here and taught, ta like, taking forever to come up with some kind of answer. Soon he'll think I'm made out of garbage. Okay, okay, okay. I think I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to say it. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to say yes. I'll, I will go. <laughs> Stop oppressing my vibes. Some people just need to mind their damn business. Passive aggressive turn from hippie dog lady. <laughs> Listen, you, just, I'm just a valuable customer who is being invaded by this negativity. Well, you, sounds like you need a better detangler to get all the knots out of that mop on your head. <laughs> you freaks and your little punk rock attitude. <laughs> I don't need all these dark auras clouding my space. I need to cleanse my body with the Rui Balls. I don't know how to say that word. Rui Balls, mint julep, orange peel, rosebud with French chamomile iced tea. <laughs> what a funny person. So now that is over. What do you say about Coffee, yeah, or nah? With my indoor voice, I say, yeah, to a coffee date. Awesome, let's meet at Perch at 12 noonish. Sounds good. And this is what's going on in my little noggin, just like a happy dance. And what actually happened after I said yes to dude. Whap! <laughs> well, that was really something. You're honestly quite special, and I hope you know that. That's hella nice of you. Wow, this is going pretty well, smiley emoji. But you're kind of weird. Shit. <laughs> Thanks, y'all. <laughs> And thank you to the San Francisco Zine Fest crew and the SF Public Library. Your roundness literally knocks my socks off, but I don't even know what that would really look like in IRL. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, 
That's hilarious. Okay. Told you that was going to be awesome. So, um, if you want to follow her on Instagram, go ahead and buy something from her Etsy shop. Take a picture now. All right, next up we have Cynthia Yun Chen. And um, Cynthia Chen is a freelance illustrator based in Oakland. Um, she shares her pain and hope as she explores relationships, Asian American identity, and personal experience in her illustrations and comics. Cynthia recently co-organized Family Style, an Asian American Pacific Islander food anthology, which promotes education on the diverse histories of AAPI food with art and writing. And you can find more of her work at CynthiaChang.com. Um, let's give it up for Cynthia. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Cynthia. Uh, I'm a Taiwanese-American uh, comics artist and illustrator. Uh, and today I have one zine that I'll be reading, as well as some uh, spoken word, which I dabble in. Uh, and it's like uh, in similar themes. It's kind of like... Um, uh, Asian American diaspora and uh, rom-com and uh, uh, deeply personal and too intimate sometimes. So uh, uh, you'll learn a lot about me today. <laughs> um, all right, I, I'm gonna start off with uh, one, one of my uh, spoken word pieces and then uh, into the zine reading. Um, and this one is called uh, Akong, and that, that's uh, Taiwanese for grandfather. Uh, and some of my spoken word is um, uh, bilingual, so there's uh, Mandarin Chinese. So uh, not everyone in the crowd may know Mandarin Chinese, but I hope that the feelings can get across. Uh, this one is about my, my grandfather in Taiwan. Taiwanese American tells you where I've been, summarized hyphenated background, but it doesn't tell you about my family and the guilt I felt when I couldn't understand my grandparents' Mandarin, doesn't tell you about my grandfather who took my art and put it on the wall, showed it to everyone like it was the National Hall of Fame, but nowadays it just doesn't look the same, in way every time Ta Hui Xiao, and Ta Hui Shuo, this is and I'll say, yeah, I'll go on with the doll. My gramps, he had stories of China, his childhood, but they never went through. You know, what could he do? But I could always feel his love through the peels of the pear. I was always focused on his hands. I never noticed his gray hairs. And the last summer I visited, I told my Akong, I said, Jin, see you next time. And I guess I was right, because the next time I saw him, he was in his casket. I was dressed in all black, fighting tears, fatigue, and jet lag, culture shock, too. I should have been having Thanksgiving dinner. Instead, I felt myself getting thinner, holding the prayer book like, Omi Tofo, Omi Tofo. And I couldn't even tell if this man I knew for 17 years was the real reason for my tears because I had only learned a warmth of his smiles just months before. All I knew before that was that he fought in the war and that he smiled brightest when at dinner we would ask for more. And so it was only till my last two weeks with him that I realized that my Agong, he truly loved me and it took 16 years to get through to my dumbass head and I regret that I couldn't tell till the end. But I'd like to say that with loss, now I'm stronger. That now I'm a warrior, nothing scares me any longer. But maybe it's just bullshit. Maybe I'm just scared of shit. Maybe just, maybe those are fake. Maybe what's a high pot that will I won't rest in peace. And we tell you, shadow away, I ta. Because I saw my grandma's heart break. When I'm a chana ama, I saw her fall to pieces. And I won't lie, when I show her her fucking high pot, what's your way, Ika ama? And she's over there alone, and I'm useless. Even on the phone, I can't translate these thoughts into words. I can't ask how she's been, if she's happy. I can't wipe those tears, but I'll wipe those fears because she still worries about the little girl who doesn't sleep enough, but I'll show her just what this little girl is made of. So, Akong, I won't forget when you took us to swim. Won't forget anything that you did, even the apples that you cut and we ate with toothpicks. I'll remember your love. And we we'll wait Ama and Mom, and I'll keep making art worthy of putting on the wall so even in your next life, you'll have a reason to smile. Um, so that was the first poem, <laughs> um, and uh, the first step into sad Asian grandparents' feelings, because uh, this next one uh, is a zine reading of uh, my zine, Shatsu uh, Zaijian, which means see you again, or it means see you next time. Uh, and this one is dedicated to my grandmother, who was briefly mentioned in the poem, uh, and it's kind of a sequel to the poem, uh, and it's kind of a promise that I 
that I've made to her in zine format. I think of her when I see laundry on the line. It reminds me that I have so many things I want to do with my Ama the next time I see her. I'll finally memorize the route to the old house where Ama goes to treat her patients. I'll help out at her garden, though I don't even know what she grows there. I'm going to get lost when I go to the morning market with Ama. Ama, where are you? <laughs> I'll practice my Taiwanese while we watch television and peel vegetables. I'm going to help her in the kitchen, and I'll learn how to make the dinners I miss so much. All the things she does without asking for anything in return, I want to be a part of it all. Next time I see Ama, I'm going to give her a big hug. Um, and that's, <laughs> uh, that's the zine where I've, um, and I actually made it for International Women's Day last year, uh, and I, I think of her often. The last summer that I visited, I, uh, I regret that I didn't spend more time with her, uh, which seems to be a theme in, in these uh, <laughs> grandparent feelings. Um, but moving on from, from that, I, uh, I'd like to present some, some like more lighthearted uh, romance <laughs> poems. <laughs> uh, and um, actually, this next one is also bilingual and is, uh, uh, it's fitting. It's, the, uh, it's someone I fell for in the summer of Taiwan that I last visited and then ended up regretting that I didn't spend more with my grandmother. So <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Uh, let me pull this up. And this one's called um, Happiness. Uh, in Chinese, that's Gaoxing. These days together have meant so much to me. Maybe you'll remember because now I'm another photo on your timeline. You'll never know how much I want to rewind, how much I wish I could extend our time together. But it wouldn't make a change. I'd still be the Mei Guo Xiao Hai, my eyes, A, B, C, Wai Sheng Nu. So please understand why I can't express this in conversation. So before these feelings go into hibernation, let me use prose to externalize these woes. You can say that I got ahead of myself, but you were like fresh air, so good for my health. So forgive me when I breathe greedily. People like you don't come easily. Now tell me, someone zhongwen so equal? We're two different people, but that's who I want to be to you. How do I become more than a child? The first time you smiled with me in your eyes, I wanted to see me there. 10,000 more times. I didn't fall in love, but I felt lovesick. I hadn't fallen in so long, but you managed to stick. I was all smiles and heartbreak because a, a love bug isn't easy to shake. But with time, this too will come to pass. So I'm grateful that you've reminded me that my heart could beat so fast. Um, and that, 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 one side the crush ended quite poorly. <laughs> so, so let me regale you with another poem about my current partner and things are going uh, less poorly. <laughs> uh, and then I actually, I have a zine as well about um, our, our silly rom-com comics about our relationship. So, so uh, perfect, it all ties in together. <laughs> uh, and this, this last one that I'll be performing is called Thank You. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I have feelings for you. I'm sorry for inconveniencing you. I'm sorry that my heart beats faster when I'm around you. Sorry, I thought it was the only word in my vocabulary until I met you. The first time I fell for you was when your smile shone so bright it burned into my thoughts. The second, when your cheeks were dusted with a light pink blush as I spilled my heart out to you. The third, when I pulled away from our hug and I felt your hands hold on for just a split second longer. Later on, I realized that was just my imagination, but that's okay. <laughs> 
I keep falling for you. I'm not covered in scrapes but thorn pricks. I've never known that when butterflies stop fluttering, flowers bloom in their stead. Thank you for being the first person I can say thank you to. Thank you for liking my cute, not pretty, handsome, but not beautiful self. I'm low-key complimenting myself, but it's true. Thank you for making me feel like the heart eyes emoji all the time. Thank you for seeing me, the value in me, and for valuing me. You teach me to see beauty in my body that I had never seen before. You take my insecurities and you spin them into beautiful stories. Thank you for teaching me I no longer have to say I'm sorry. And that's all for me. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, thank you. That was amazing. And next up, last but not least, we have Nidhi Chenini. I'm sorry, I'm destroying your names today. I'm so sorry. Um, she's a freelance illustrator, cartoonist, and writer. She's the owner of Everyday Love Art, and her de debut graphic novel, Peshmina, was released by First Second Books in October of 2017, which you can get later today over on the table. Uh, it's an Indian American, cart she's also an Indian American cartoonist um, oh, I'm sorry, on, on the nib right now, she has a comic, uh, which is an Indian American cartoonist that reflects on the struggle of passing her cultural heritage down to her daughter thousands of miles from its origin. So check it out on the nib. Is it up for long or just this week? Just there. Awesome. So it's a great read. I read it earlier this week. Um, uh, but without further ado, Nidhi Chan, Chanini. Chanani. Chanani. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, um, and thanks for having me, and thanks for sticking around. So I don't have multiple things, I have one thing. I didn't know we were supposed to do multiple things. I just feel like, I'm like, oh, I only have one thing. I actually have a lot more things. Um, I've been doing this for 10 years, so I have over a thousand illustrations. That's how I started my career, and then um, while I was doing illustration work, but always kind of love comics, and um, in the middle of doing my illustration work, I pitched and sold my first graphic novel, Pashmina. So I am gonna share with you guys um, some pages from Pashmina. And so I'll give you a basis of understanding what's going on with where we're picking up, if I remember what my pages are. Um, but the story is about an uh, Indian American girl named Priyanka Das who lives with her single mom in Orange County. And um, she's just learning how to drive. She's 16. She's starting to question a lot of the things in her life that were not, that were assumed and were not able to, she was not able or allowed to ask questions about. And in the midst of all of this kind of stuff that's happening with her internally at school and with her mother, she finds a magical Pashmina shawl. And when she wraps herself in the shawl, she's transported to a fantasy version of India. And so, let me see where we, that's me, that's the cover. Okay, so here we are, and um, now I know where, where this is in the book. So she's already used the Pashmina a couple times, and um, here she is kind of now intrigued about India in a way that she's never been before. Anyway, Yermita Mossi and I love going to the cinema, especially to see Mumtaz or Zina Taman films. Are those your favorite actresses? I also liked Amitabh and Rekha. Now I want to go to the cinema. Did you wear a sari every day? Not at your age. I wore salvars like this, but when I was older, before coming here, yes, every day. Looking at new saris was your Masi's favorite time pass. She loves fabric and embroidery work. I don't know why you're asking so many questions. We missed you at the hospital today. The baby is going to be sick for a while. I couldn't go. I know it's sad, but your uncle D Jatin and Auntie Deepa need our support. Sometimes we have to do the hard things. <laughs> She's crying. 
There's the pashmina. Just need sound effects. What happened? I can't see. Say goodbye to those date killers, Priyanka Das. It's Pri. Whoa, how strange. Oh, my Gulab Jamun, you're in for a treat. Huh? Follow me. What now? Don't worry, my sweet Sandesh. Yuck. I hate Indian sweets. Hate away, darling. You don't have to eat them. Clap, clap. Hey. Clap. Ding. Clap. Wah, wah. Clap. I feel so Indian. How do you walk in this thing? Hi, cute stuff. Hey, go away. Tap, tap, tap. Who or what was that? Nothing, Ladu. Don't mind it. That's it. So it's kind of like a little taste. Um, there's a lot in the book, so you'll have to check it out from the library or get a copy here to find out more. So thank you so much. <laughs> and that concludes the reading. Um, we do have time, I believe, for a little Q&A. Um, Anad, did you want to come up and say a couple words about Seems Fest? Sure, why not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome, Anad, our fearless leader, director of Hey. Up. Hi guys, first of all, who here has been to SF Scene Fest before? Okay, mostly people on this side. I don't know what's going on with you guys over there. Uh, as, as you can see up there, it's happening this Sunday on September 2nd. Um, last year, as this year, we had about 220 exhibitors. Last year, about 6,000 people attended the one day event. So it's gonna be amazing, it's gonna be fantastic. And this year, we also have food including Indian ice cream, if you've never had it. I guess Priyanka would hate it, or does she like Kofi? How can anyone hate? hate it. She hates them all. Oh, no. terrible. <laughs> um, but yeah, we also have workshops with Creativity Explored. Uh, if Who here knows about Creativity Explored? Um, Awesome. They work with artists uh, who have disabilities, and they're going to be doing a panel. Lawrence, again, who is <laughs> being mentioned up here, uh, he did workshops with them, zine making workshops with artists for two weeks. So a couple of the artists will be there showcasing their work and also selling their work. Uh, and members from, from the organization will be there to talk about what they do and how they help um, people with disabilities. And there'll also be screen printing. So if you have a t-shirt, just grab a t-shirt, bring it with you, and they will screen print and design for you. They as in print, organize, and protest. Pop will be there. That's really about it, what I have for <laughs> SF Zine Fest. It's happening. We hope to see you there. Um, you can still volunteer for it. We have some posters and postcards up there that you can volunteer for. By the way, if you didn't know already, our guest of honor is Nidhi Chanani, who is right there, who was our last reader. Um, you can also check out all the zines and books uh, from all of our readers today on the tables. We kind of have to clean up in a little bit, but <laughs> I'd like to thank Andrea for having us once again. Thank you so much. And of course, San Francisco Public Library for hosting us yet again for another event. Um, did you want to add anything else? Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I'm actually really looking forward to uh, purchasing some. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Did anyone have any questions for our readers? It's okay if you don't. You can talk to them while you have a chance. <laughs> thank you all so much for coming. All right, thank you guys.